So what's an alternative to this, what I call political environmentalism? And as, as uh, Josh mentioned in my introduction, I'm uh, somewhat known for uh, the third, now in the third edition, but a book called Free Market Environmentalism. This is a picture of the first edition, and when it came out, a reviewer of the book uh, said, free market environmentalism is an oxymoron, comma, and the authors it's co-authored are the moron part. Now, I thought it was a pretty clever line, at least, but it tells you what people thought of the notion of taking free markets and environmentalism and trying to put them on one cover of a book without you know, some sort of bullets flying between the two. Uh, Don and I worked for a while, and 10 years later, we published the second edition. And what changed was we started finding examples of people actually using markets to solve environmental problems. And then the third edition came out uh, four years ago, uh, third and last as far as we're concerned, uh, not because we don't still have passion about it, but we're both old. Uh, and we'd rather fish than, than write books. Uh, and now free market environmentalism has become, it used to be, you know, if I said free market environmentalism, I could really stir up a crowd of environmentalists. Today it's like, oh, oh, oh yeah, of course. And, and, and it's been fascinating, not, not because of this book, I don't claim that I, I caused what I see as a sea change, but it, it, it really is a way that at least some environmental problems are being solved using environmental markets is the title of my this, uh, remarks. And it basically is quite simple. I'm often said, you're an economist, answer a question, but use 25 words or less, uh, which is hard for any economist to do unless we get a graph. Uh, but I, I, I think I can capture it with these two points. One, wealthier is healthier, not just for people, but for the environment. And if you ask, who wears these? Go to a village in Africa where elephants have just trampled the, the corn crop and tell them, oh, we need to, these are endangered and we need to save them. They look at you like you're crazy because they don't have the wherewithal to be able to put up with elephants trampling corn crops. So it tends to be those of us who wear this hat, and I put myself in this category, are rich. We can afford to say, save red cockaded woodpeckers, save the, uh, the jumping something mouse in Colorado, and the list goes on. So wealthier is, is, is an important part of what free markets give us. That's again back to Peter's discussion. And the second one is quite simple, incentives matter. Incentives matter because what's the incentive? Is the incentive to create old growth trees or to create habitat? And if they're your trees and you don't get anything for the habitat, then it's old growth trees or young growth trees. And as uh, uh, Peter pointed out, Prices give you a lot of information about these benefits. But importantly, and, and this is the subtitle, Environmental Markets, a Property Rights Approach, property rights are what makes the environment an asset. And that's key to understanding how markets can work. Or, as I, I in a book here uh, that I published at Hoover a few years back, we had a chapter entitled, No One Washes a Rental Car. And that popped up too fast, because. Uh, some smart-ass student in a lecture said, that's not true. And I said, what do you mean? I rent a car all the time. I've never washed one. And he said, Hertz washes them. I thought, point made. Uh, incentives matter. I don't have any incentive to wash a rental car. I'm going to take it back in three days, maybe even a week, <laughs> maybe two weeks. It can get muddy as can be. But if it's my car or if it's Hertz's car, they're going to wash that car. So the question is, how can we create incentives for people to consider the environment to be an asset? And it means lots of things about the property rights, that, again, that, that Peter was talking about. Uh, there are, you know, pay damages if, they're, if you're an environmentalist and people are, are having to face the cost. Pay them to grow uh, red cockaded woodpeckers. Purchase the whole thing. Purchase the, the, the land that would be habitat and make it into habitat. Purchase things and then rebundle them. I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Or just simply create some property rights. These are all, all ways you can think about it. But let's just go back to the wolf example. This is the environmental friend who thought last missing link in the ecosystem, Hank Fisher. 
And he called me. He was he was at, in on the point and all this. And he he talked. <laughs> this is a great story. He talked to me once. So early on, he went down to Ashton, Idaho, which is on the the western border of Yellowstone Park, a pretty pretty big sheep producing area. And he said I he was down there to give a speech at the local Kiwanis Club or somebody about about the virtues of wolf reintroduction and this, you know, last missing link. And he walked in and it was this, you know, sea of cowboy hats, <laughs> like the one I had on. And he looked out and he said, <laughs> said, I knew this was gonna be a tough sell. And he didn't even get to start. And this is a quote from Hank. He said, a guy in the back of the room said, Hank Fisher, ain't nobody killed you yet? He said, I knew this was gonna be a tough sell. Uh, but Hank and I had been friends a long time and Hank, Hank called me one day, he said, I think I'm getting it. I'm asking them to bear the costs and I get the benefits. What can we do? And I, this was his idea. His idea was, what if I can raise money and pay for any damages caused by wolves? Your cow gets killed, I'll pay you for it. Well, it may not make you a wolf lover. It may not make you think, oh, last missing link in the ecosystem. But at least you don't say, Hank Fisher, ain't nobody killed you yet. <laughs> And so Hank, Hank had a local uh, artist in Missoula, Montana, produce the poster. I, the poster is probably worth a lot of money today. Uh, the, the actual painting, he made it into a poster, sold them for $35, sold them, put the money into a trust fund, and said, I'll pay you if you lose livestock to wolf predation. Now, he, he required some proof of that. You couldn't you know, have old Bessie die out in the field and say, oh, Bessie died, must have been a wolf. Uh, and, and he didn't pay for children uh, if they got eaten by wolves. Uh, but he said, I'll pay you. That trust fund has continued to grow faster than its payments. Because as he thought, I don't think the predation is going to be nearly as bad as the ranchers are worried about. So he has paid them off. Now I have to add, Hank left Defenders of Wildlife who sponsored this program, because they wanted to turn it over to the federal government. We shouldn't have to pay. Let's have the taxpayers in general pay. Hank said, as soon as you do that, this is going to fail. And indeed, the ranchers are not as happy any longer. But Hank didn't stop. He went out and started working on another program. This is, uh, I always ask, can you see the barrel of pollution in this picture? If you're a rancher, a bison in Yellowstone migrating out carrying something called brucellosis and transmitting it to your cattle herd means <coughs> you are in deep doo-doo. You won't be able to sell your cows outside of Montana and you go through a big quarantine process and so bison migration is a big problem. Hank looked at this and says, trivial. The problem is not that they're always there, but bison are there some of the time at the same time cattle are. What if we just got ranchers to not have their cattle there? Well, if you go to a rancher and say, don't have your cattle there in June, they say, well, where am I supposed to put them? Hank says, I have a deal for you. I will rent you pasture over here. And so Hank single-handedly through, oops, sorry. I don't know how, how I go backwards. Uh, Hank single-handedly, simply by going to the local restaurant and negotiating with these ranchers, has retired, even more now, this, I got this a year ago, I think, over 700,000 acres of grazing by simply saying, I will pay you to find alternative grazing. I'll buy you alternative grazing. And he has simply moved the cattle out of harm's way. Just recognizing the farmers, ranchers, have a property right in the cattle, and they don't want to have their property right destroyed by brucellosis. He's very entrepreneurial. He's thinking about who's bearing the costs, and what are the benefits, and paying some of it by honoring the property rights that are there. I wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal. They gave the title, but I always use it as if I did, Buy That Fish a Drink. This was involving uh, streams like a, the one pictured here, near where I live in Montana, the uh, uh, Ruby River, dewatered because of the sprinkler that's shown here. And fishermen get really ticked off when they come to that stream and say, I can't really fish there. <laughs> that pool has belly up trout in it because they don't have enough oxygen. I can't fish in the rocks. Uh, what should we do about it? Well, tell the farmers to stop irrigating. That'll fix it. And the farmer says, I have a thing called a water right. 
and you can't have it. And so the article that I wrote was entitled, Buy That Fish a Drink. Go out and negotiate this. And in fact, environmental groups have started saying, yeah, let's get the person decked out from the Orvis catalog, head to foot, you know, $600 waders, $2,000 fly rod, $1,000 reel, uh, and the list goes on. Maybe that person will cough up a little bit of money and buy some water rights to leave them in streams. The groups that have done this have really gotten quite innovative in how they go about these negotiations. They use option contracts, that is if there's lots of water flowing and you can irrigate and still have water in the stream, you don't want to be paying somebody to leave it. But if, it's a, if, if, if there isn't enough water, they exercise their option to buy or rent water. Uh, Oregon is famous for this. Turns out I'm sitting on the plane this morning reading The Economist magazine, and uh, the title is A Liquid Market, and it's all about water markets in California. Okay, that's not a big deal. They've been doing this for, for quite some time. There are groundwater sustainability agencies, GSAS, and these agencies are worried about groundwater sustainability, subsidence, and all the things that come with groundwater problems. Listen to this paragraph. I might, might just ask you, who do you think is advising these agencies on how to deal with the sustainability of water, given that lots of the groundwater is going into sprinklers? You might say, hydrologists, they'd be a good person, good, good group to go to. Or economists, they'd know something about the trade-offs here. Given the potential benefits of market-based approach, nonprofits such as Environmental Defense Fund, the Freshwater Trust, and the Nature Conservancy have stepped up to advise GASIS on how to set up markets around California. These are not economists. They're not people who, who, who read Adam Smith or, or Friedrich Hayek. These are people who just said, look, we're, we're, we're trying to get something going here that recognizes that the water rights that people have. So it, it's, it, <laughs> I couldn't believe it was so timely in that regard. The Nature Conservancy I just mentioned, they've been very involved in this fisheries issue. Uh, Morro Bay, a bit south of here along the coast, is a place where the trawlers fisheries, the, the bottom draggers that would uh, just really stir up the bottom by catching lots of fish, uh, but destroying kelp, destroying uh, shellfish that were of no value, uh, were really uh, causing decimation to the environment. And so the Nature Conservancy went in and they bought up the, the netting rights of these, these fishers in Morro Bay. And they paid a, a handsome price for them. But who do you think didn't like this? And the people who sold said, well, willing buyer, willing seller, uh, they'll pay me more than I think my netting right is worth. Who else might, who might not have liked this? Hint, Morro Bay is a small community where these fishermen bought clothes and bought food. Get in the story? <laughs> All of a sudden, the local coffee shop owner said, well, now the fishermen don't come in every morning and chat about fishing. They're not here anymore. My coffee shop isn't doing as well. And the list goes on. And who was to blame for this? The bad guys with the red bandanas, right? They're easy to blame. If you, uh, you, know, you don't like the result, you say, the environmentalists are evil. They're pinko communists who are, you know. So they were really upset, and Nature Conservancy didn't like this reputation. But the Nature Conservancy, again, took a property rights approach. They said, let's just repackage this bundle. They said, the problem isn't all fishing. It's fishing of a certain type at a certain time. What if we put constraints on the netting rights that we now own and rent or sell them back to fishermen and tell them, here's how you fish and here's where you fish and here's when you fish? Fishermen said, great. The Nature Conservancy is now making a profit <laughs> off of these netting rights. The fishermen are happy. The local cafes are happy. It's win-win all the way around. And it was because the Nature Conservancy simply thought about it in a property rights kind of context. And I've worked with the TNC, the Environmental Defense Fund, and others. Uh, and again, it's not that I have taught them this or that they you know, went into the library and pulled off the wealth of nations and said, oh, epiphany, I now know how to, how to use markets. They simply are saying, this is something that can actually work. But 
Let me talk about the mother of them all, because you know, people often say, I had this, I was lecturing to some law professors recently using some of these kinds of examples, and somebody said, these are just anecdotes. And I said, yeah, but if you have enough anecdotes, they make a line, maybe. Uh, I think that there's a trend here. I can, I can point to when we didn't do this at all, and now we're doing it, it helps. Well, if you're so smart, what about global warming? Uh, how do you take a property rights approach to that one? And you know, I always my answer is, if I were that smart, you think I'd be standing here? I'd be rich. <laughs> I would be solving that problem. Uh, you know, I'd be doing what Bjorn's doing to get rich. <laughs> uh, uh, so, how does all this fit in? Well, some people say, well, the problem is that you know we don't have the right price on carbon. And so a couple of solutions that then pop up.